This morning I'm talking about consciousness and the heart. And I think you're going to find how timely today's talk is in relationship to the news that we just heard that's going on in Orlando. So I'm not going to say any more about it so we don't bring that energy in this morning, but uh, just keep it in mind. And I might mention it a little bit later in the talk, but for now, talks like today are more important than ever when we see how the world is becoming more intellectually oriented as opposed to heart oriented, more concrete mind oriented than soul oriented. When this happens, a crisis occurs, not just in your own personal life, but in the life of humanity. Because what happens is that the light of humanity begins to dim. The darkness of the concrete mind and the intellect begins to take over uh, the, the consciousness of mankind, making mankind, making humanity, making you, making uh, your friends and family members in part focused on what is wrong with life, what is wrong with the planet. Uh, the doomsday, you know, of predictions and prophecy and, uh, and like the event that happened uh, early, early this morning, uh, Eastern Daylight Time, begins to make people question see, the purpose of life and uh, the nature of a human being. We don't want darkness to win. See, we want to polarize people to a greater level of understanding of how precious life is, how sacred each life is, that within the human being is the heart, and within the heart is the spark. And the spark of the heart is so sacred that when we connect that spark with the divine part of our consciousness, which for most of us is the solar angel, that's when all these great ones that have walked before us have succeeded in reminding humanity about the sacred of life. So that's what we are doing here every Sunday, giving these lectures, taking the lectures home, the words of the lectures home, and thinking about it, thinking, wait a minute, I'm not going to immerse myself in the anger and hatred and hostility and bigoted and berating and belittlement and bruising and bashing you know, that goes on and on and on, you know, in the world today. It's so prevalent. So let us, as light bearers, carry that beacon of light, our beacon of light, our heart nature into that darkness and bring hope wherever we can bring hope. And then the next point that you must challenge yourself with is not to be, become immersed see, in the darkness of other people because they will work very hard to try to enslave you in their own darkness. So when we hear, when we woke up this morning and we heard the news about what happened in Orlando, that's when we become caught up in the sense of helplessness and hopelessness and what is this world becoming. See, that's just 
a small part of life. The part of life that we want to focus on is the continuity of life and the expansion of consciousness and the nature of the heart and how, bringing me back in today's talk here, you know, how consciousness and the heart work together. Last week, I gave a basic definition of consciousness, saying that consciousness has a core. Well, everything has a core. It's like what Richard was reading in the poetry this morning, that a flower has a core, that everything blossoms and blooms from that core. So now we learned that consciousness also has a core. And what is the core? For us, we know that the core is the human soul. So at the core of our consciousness is the human soul. Consciousness is then the light of your soul. The greater the light, the greater your consciousness. The smaller your light, the dimmer your light, the smaller your consciousness. Without our soul, there is no light. So today I am talking about consciousness and the nature of the heart. Now, consciousness must always work in cooperation with the heart. When your soul, the light of your soul, is functioning in such a radiatory expression, it is then that you know that there is a cooperation taking place between your soul and your heart, between your consciousness and your heart. Now, the heart, listen to this, I, some of this is going to be a little abstract and then I'm going to get into more commonplace words that you're going to understand, so stay with me, concentrate. The heart regulates the actions of your consciousness. The heart regulates the actions of your consciousness. If you have a decayed heart, if you have a black heart, that heart is still going to regulate the actions of your consciousness. But my focus this morning is not to talk about the decaying heart or the black heart. It's to talk about the core, which is our soul, which is our light. And that when our awareness, our sense of um, life and purpose and sacredness is right there in front of us, right there with our thoughts, our feelings, our words, our actions, that is when our heart is regulating our consciousness. Our heart is controlling our consciousness. When this happens, the consciousness is in harmony with the rhythm of the universe. So that's telling us that the harmony or the rhythm of the universe is what regulates our heart if it is not in a state of decomposition and not in the state of being a black heart. Is that, is that clear? Okay. The heart is our innermost consciousness. So now we've learned that consciousness has a core, the core is our human soul, and we are learning that our heart is our innermost consciousness. So with this information, I've given us two key points about consciousness. The first, consciousness is the light of your soul. And the next point is the heart is our innermost consciousness. If you are taking written or mental notes, these are the two important points 
to remember or to contemplate. Our consciousness expands when the intelligence of our soul, this is also called the intelligence thread, when the intelligence of our soul or the intelligence thread of our soul fuses with the flame of our heart with the help of the solar angel, that's when our consciousness expands. It doesn't say that when we come hugely intelligent, when our IQ is 140 or 50 or 60 or 70, maybe 80, that that's when we have a lighted consciousness. It's not saying that. The teaching is not telling us. The teaching is saying that our consciousness can only expand when the intelligence of our soul fuses with the flame in the heart. And another way to say this is that our consciousness thread must fuse with the life thread in our heart. When the consciousness thread fuses with the life thread that is anchored in your heart, then our consciousness begins to expand. Okay, Are we, okay. So what does this mean to us? It means that with the fusion of these two energies, the consciousness thread and the life thread, this is so important, pay attention to this, we begin to be conscious of the rights of other people. That obviously was not the case with that horrible shooting this morning. That is not the case when people practice harmfulness to you or to your family or to your country or to the planet. It is only when there is a fusion of these two energies that we then, as a soul, as a group, as a humanity, become conscious of the rights of the other people. That's so powerful to understand. Unless our consciousness is in harmony with the flame of our heart, there is no expansion. What does that mean? It means you're in this cocoon and you can't see or feel or sense anything else but yourself. It's like being a, in a room filled with mirrors. And everywhere you look, everywhere you look, wow, there I am. <laughs> that person does not have a lighted consciousness. That means that the soul of that person is buried in ash. What is of interest is that this present time in this particular solar system, expansion of consciousness is now possible with the cosmic ray of compassion. Your heart, my heart, carries the flame of compassion. This cosmic ray is expressed through what? Love, wisdom. Love, wisdom. Once the consciousness begins to expand, it is then that higher thoughts are impressed in our lighted consciousness and charged with creativity. Last week, I said that one of the ways to expand our consciousness is through creativity. So now we have two ways. First, that fusion, and now creativity. Creativity is expressed when the pure essence of our solar angel begins to manifest through our actions, through our words, through our thoughts. At this moment, our actions are controlled by what? A divine manifestation 
and becomes goal fitting. That divine manifestation is the influence of the solar angel. The solar angel is a member of the spiritual hierarchy. So meditate on the word goal fitting. Helena Rourke and the great sage always emphasized goal fittingness. Every action that you are doing, dancing, walking, working, sitting, even doing business, every physical action must fit, must strengthen, must contribute to your goal of capital S self revelation. That is why, for an example, an initiate, a master, a Christ, a Buddha, puts his hands on you and you are healed. Who is healing? It is not the hand. That creative energy that is pouring forth through the hands of that great one is rearranging all the cells and atoms within your system. And you are becoming whole, not a piece. You are becoming whole. So you may say, well, who meets a master? Who meets an initiate? Well, if all you can think of is physical, then when you're healed, you're going to say it's a miracle. But when you realize that a master can be present in any plane of consciousness and at various places at the same time around the world, then why cannot the Christ or the Buddha or the master or initiate heal this planet? They heal you. See, that's how we want to begin to think. Creativity is an effort to bring increasing fire out of ourselves, fire by friction, solar fire, or electric fire. It means to kindle your flames, radiate fire, and create a link between the planet and the fires of space. See, I know this is abstract, but think about it. You don't want to come here on Sunday and hear everything, the same thing over and over again, and everything you know, and say, oh, I know that. This you don't know. <laughs> OK. So creativity is an act of sacrifice. When a being of light lets his fires flame out and uplift the masses of humanity, that's called sacrificial service. The transfiguration of the evolving soul, a stage of our soul's evolution, that transfiguration evokes fire from space. See our connectivity? Yeah. Transfiguration of the soul is taken at what we are called the third initiation of consciousness. It is at this point our human soul becomes very powerful. Creative people are carriers of fire. They have a fiery conscience, consciousness. Conscience, too. They spread their fire through what? Through their books. No longer in caves, although that, in some case, is still occurring. But they have to be present somewhere, somehow. That presence must be felt and understood and read and acknowledged. And so they are now spreading their fire through their books paintings, music, and examples of living. This fire then slowly penetrates into the hearts of those who come in contact with these carriers of fire. So we look at these great images we have on the wall. 
St. Sergius. He is still, that fire is still radiating in space and precipitating through the rhythm of the heart of the universe and activating our own heart, igniting the flame in our own heart. And he's been gone for some time, but only gone physically. Now, this fire must not be forced on anyone, but it can be expressed through beauty. One with a fiery consciousness creates crises. Wherever she goes, if the people around her cannot assimilate her fires. You know, normally I would use the masculine his fires, wherever he goes. But look at how the world is changing. Now we have a woman that is the presumptive, what do you, what is the word? Nominee. What? <laughs> Nominee <laughs> for president, whatever. You know, when it was, how many, 75 years ago, a woman couldn't even vote? So let's keep the Tara in mind. These great women masters, the mother of the world, of which there are many petals of the mother of the world in the world today. Let us find them and let us use the feminine in our lectures, as long as it's not fanatical. Hopefully this does not sound fanatical. The consciousness of such people is an opportunity for those who have no resistance to the creative fire. For example, Mahatma Gandhi, the great souled one. I'm going to talk a little bit about his life because he is an example. And I didn't have time to bring up a bunch of women. I'm sorry, you know, there's, there's a lot of women that we can think of that represent a carrier of fire and the crises that that fire they carried around them created. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about Mahatma Gandhi. He began his activism as an Indian immigrant in South Africa in the early 1900s. And in the years that followed World War I, he became a leading figure in India's struggle to gain independence from Great Britain. This is a carrier of fire. He, this is not a person who just happened to have a cause. <laughs> this is a fiery carrier who is penetrating into the hearts of many, many people. He was known for his ascetic lifestyle. He often dressed only in a loin cloth and shawl, and he was a devout Hindu of devout Hindu faith. Gandhi was imprisoned several times during his pursuit of non-cooperation. He understood a number of hunger strikes. He undertook, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on in a minute. He undertook a number of hunger strikes to protect the oppression of India's poorest classes, among other injustices. After partition in 1947 of the British Indian Empire, he continued to work toward peace between Hindus and Muslims. Gandhi was shot to death in Delhi in January in 1948 by a Hindu fundamentalist. Gandhi's eloquence and embrace of an ascetic lifestyle based on prayer and fasting and meditation earned him the reverence of his followers who called him Mahatma, which means the great souled one, S-O-U-L-E-D, the great souled one. Invested with all the authority of the Indian National Congress, Congress 
Gandhi turned the independence movement into a massive organization. This is one little guy wearing a loincloth, <laughs> leading boycotts of British manufacturers and institutions representing British influence in India, including legislatures and schools. In 1947, Britain granted India its independence, but split the country into two dominions, India and Pakistan. Gandhi strongly opposed partition, but he agreed to it in hopes that after independence, Hindus and Muslims could achieve peace internally. Amid the massive riots that followed partition, Gandhi urged, Gandhi urged Hindus and Muslims to live peacefully together and undertook a hunger strike until riots in Calcutta ceased. In January of 1948, Gandhi carried out his last fast. Twelve days after that fast ended, Gandhi was on his way to an evening prayer, meeting in Delhi when he was shot to death by a Hindu fanatic, enraged by the Mahatma's efforts to negotiate with Jinnah and other Muslims. The next day, roughly one million people followed the procession, procession as Gandhi's body was carried in state through the streets of the city and cremated on the banks of the Holy River. Isn't that interesting? And he never gave up. He never quit. He never gave in. In the teaching, we read about fiery armor. This fiery armor is a gift from those fiery beings who mastered the life and released the highest fire within themselves. They then offer this armor to those who have cleansed themselves from the darkness, the elements of darkness. So we are told that only those who have this armor can reach the tower, the highest creative center in man and on the planet. This tower is also called Chambala. Helena Rourke wrote in her diary, tonight with the great one, I visited Shambhala. She was a young woman when she accompanied her husband high into the Himalayas for a long-lasting exhibition expedition. One day, when their tents were set up in the valley, she said, I want to climb to that mountain peak. Later, the Great One wrote about that event with these words. He wrote, that was the symbolic spirit of Helena Rourke. She always strove to the heights. He called her the bird of the heights. Such striving of consciousness slowly connects you with the center where the will of God is known. That great one known as the Master Moria gave us a prayer to sound, and this was the prayer. O Lord of beauty, let me stand in your temple of Kalu Supernal, and within the symphonies of divine. May I achieve harmony with the heart of the cosmic rhythm and radiate the uplifting, expanding beauty of that heart in all my actions, aspirations, and visions. Isn't that beautiful? And that's, those are words that we want to carry with us. A clean heart, a peaceful heart, a pure heart that always radiates love and compassion and cares for those who need help survives long, healthy years. The fire of the heart is psychic energy. Did you know that? 
Yeah, the fire of the heart is psychic energy. It is the most powerful agent of healing, illuminating, uplifting, and transforming. It is also this energy that builds a layer of fire around your aura, which is the shield that will protect you if you have an illumined consciousness. And in this protection, and in this illumined consciousness, when you are attacked, it sends all those dark arrows back to their sources with devastating results. The fire existing in your heart is the fire of psychic energy. See, there is no need to take revenge. No need for you to take revenge. This is why in the Bible it says, the Lord says, revenge is, revenge is mine. Right? Now we're understanding it. This is the esoteric side of what the Great One was talking about. So I'm going to repeat this. The fire of the heart is psychic energy. That's the first thing I said. Then I said it is also this energy that builds a layer of fire around your aura. This is the shield. This fire around your aura is the shield which protects you because you now have an illumined consciousness. That's a key. You have an illumined consciousness. This fire protects you and sends all the dark arrows back that have been sent to you, directed to you. It sends the arrows back to the sources with de devastating results. Again, the fire existing in your heart is the fire of psychic energy. This energy, when it is united with the fire of space, dissolves all the toxins in the body, in the emotions, in your mind. The great ones with all their age-long labors learned how to do it, how to flame the fire of the heart with the fires of space, how to fuse the fires of the heart with the fires of space. This is the secret of their mastery over the elements, their power and wisdom. It is the belief of many of those whose path is to serve humanity that they must cultivate their heart to protect themselves from various attacks in the future. These attacks are increasing. We see them increasing. We saw the evidence of it this morning. And will increase as the years go by. These attacks are, there's nine that I've listed. The first is the attack of insanity and confusion. Number two, the attacks of otherness which is a sickness in which a person loses his identity and lives and acts as if he were somebody else. Number three, the attacks of self-deception. The attacks of self-deception. The fourth is the attacks of electrical and subliminal currents. The attacks of electrical and subliminal currents. The fifth is attacks of satanic groups exercising their power with the black arts. Number six, attacks of chemical poisoning and radiation. Number seven, attacks of increasing hatred and fear. Number eight, attack of totalitarian activities. And number nine, this may surprise you, attacks of astral corpses 
and dark entities due to increasing mediumistic activities. Mediumistic activities has taken on, this is my opinion, has taken on a very different understanding from when I first began studying the teaching. When I first began studying the teaching, mediumistic activities was, um, you know, a psychic that was channeling entities uh, or that went into trance. To, in today's world, because of drug abuse, because of marijuana, because of all these, how do you pronounce it, opioids? These are mediumistic activities. What is happening is in engaging oneself in these kinds of activity, they are burning the protective webs between their centers. And there is now no protection. And this is allowing these astral corpses to come in with the dark entities and attacks the world. Pretty shocking, I know, but this is what I believe. Now, each zodiac sign is associated with a virtue. This month we are celebrating the second full moon of Gemini, and I'll be talking about this next Sunday. The virtue of Gemini that is given to every soul conscious Gemini is to practice harmlessness. At the present, practicing harmlessness is not easy. It is not easy to live a life based on the spirit of harmlessness. And this is why we are witnessing the increase of destructive and degenerative diseases. The flame of the heart increases every time we involve ourselves with compassionate activity. See how easy this is? <laughs> the flame of the heart increases every time we involve ourselves with compassionate activities and increase the spirit of loving understanding. Every drop of fire gathered by such activities eventually will increase the flame in our heart. There are damaging factors that put the flame of the heart out that can even petrify the heart. These factors are all those thoughts, words, and actions that hinder the spiritual progress of others. Increase fear in others and try to control the life and activities of people and groups. And thus, it is not easy to live a life based on the spirit of harmlessness. But if you carefully listened to the verse that Richard read this morning, and if you didn't hear that, what he said, what he read in that poem by Torquem Serdarian, was to align yourself with thoughts of light. So what does that mean to align ourselves with? The first is the teaching. The next is beauty and those that express beauty in their lives. When you are under attack, imagine your heroes. For me, I think of Torquem, I think of Helena Rourke, I think of Nicholas Rourke, you know, and some other handful of beings because they always we're in the light. And they practice that spirit of harmlessness. The heart, I said, is our innermost consciousness. So that I'm wrapping this up now. So the heart is our innermost consciousness. I, today I gave us two key points about consciousness. First, that consciousness is the light of our soul. And the next point is that our heart, 
The heart is our innermost consciousness. I said that our consciousness can expand when the intelligence of our soul or that intelligence thread fuses with the flame of the heart. See the balance of heart and mind. When our heart is in rapport with the consciousness of the cosmic heart, it will never decide something against our eternal interest. Master Borya, the great sage, the great teacher said, only the energy of the heart makes a person invulnerable and carries him or her over obstacles. It didn't say his PhD degree, <laughs> but the heart. Okay, so that's, that's it this morning. I hope you enjoyed it. You know, it's, it's really, it's, for me, it's a, quite an honor to be able to even put together a talk like this and then to share it. 